the dramatic ruins of Tintagel Castle sit atop craggy hills with waves crashing against steep cliffs. Dating from the 13th century, the fortress is located in the far southwest of England in the county of Cornwall. It's a fascinating remnant from the Middle Ages. But it also looms large in the British imagination as the dramatic site of the legendary King Arthur's life and times, the monarch who presided over the Knights of the Round Table. Historians unearthed evidence that could prove the existence of the real King Arthur. King Arthur's story first recorded in detail by a Welshman, Geoffrey of Monmouth, in 1136, spread across Britain and medieval Europe as an exciting tale of knights, battles and fair maidens. Even today, the tales of Arthur's bravery echo around the world. As many as 250,000 make the pilgrimage to Tintagel Castle each year to marvel at the purported stronghold of King Arthur and his nobles. But there's a huge question mark over this early British king. Did he actually exist? That's a mystery that still exercises historians today. We'll start on a journey of discovery by tracing Arthur's history as closely as we can. But as we'll see, separating fact from fiction when it comes to King Arthur is no simple task. It's a labyrinth of truths, half-truths and warring historians. What is probably the very earliest reference to a warrior king called Arthur comes in a poem called Why Gododon, perhaps written in 638 AD. That's only about 100 years after Arthur is said to have lived, making it almost contemporary compared to some sources. But the only surviving copy of this work actually dates from six centuries after that. So there has to be a question mark over how trustworthy this late copy is. Judging the authenticity and accuracy of ancient documents is a problem that dogs efforts to establish the truth about Arthur. Another work, said to be by a monk called Nennius, describes Arthur as a British warrior who defended his homeland against the invading Saxons. But it was written circa 828, some 300 years after Arthur was supposed to have died in battle. The oldest version we have of that comes from three centuries later. Yet another chronicle, the Annals of Wales written by the scholars of St. David's Monastery, gives more detail about the elusive Arthur. But this account was written in 977 again many hundreds of years after Arthur is supposed to have lived. It's impossible to say what amendments might have been made to the original manuscript over the years. It seems that we can seldom rely on ancient sources about King Arthur. It was Geoffrey of Monmouth's 12th century work, History of the Kings of Britain, that put meat on the bones of King Arthur's story. Of course, like the other sources we've mentioned it was written centuries after Arthur is supposed to have ruled. Even so, it is the basis for much of the accounts of the king's life that came after the Monmouth Residence Chronicle. Serious historians regard Monmouth's work with a healthy dose of skepticism, to say the least. Writing in the Smithsonian Magazine in September 2022 Joshua Hammer explained, scholars have universally dismissed Geoffrey's text as a pseudo-history, woven from ancient Welsh folk tales and his febrile imagination. But he goes on to point out that many of his contemporaries took Monmouth's account at face value. And in 1233 Richard, Earl of Cornwall, actually bought the Tintagel site, convinced of its Arthurian links. This Richard was brother to the English monarch of the time, Henry III. After Richard took ownership of the Tintagel site he built a castle, and those are the ruins that we see there today. He's said to have traded three of his most valuable estates to buy the Tintagel land, which is nothing more than a rocky headland with little actual worth. But he was driven by the belief that he was buying real estate that once had been home to King Arthur. Local archaeologist Wynne Scott gave his view on Richard's purchase to the Smithsonian magazine. It had no function. It's in a remote part of Cornwall that had no use to him. But he wanted to anchor his position in legend and history. He was the Earl of Cornwall, but he was also the successor of Arthur. Such was the power of Arthurian legend, even back in the 13th century. So what did Monmouth actually tell us about Arthur? For a start he made him a king, whereas the earlier sources we've mentioned merely described him as a local leader and warrior. He also introduced Arthur's Queen Guinevere, the magician Merlin, and mentioned Arthur's legendary sword, Excalibur. These were all new additions to the Arthur legend. Further doubt is cast on Monmouth's work by some of the non-Arthurian facts he included in his History of the Kings of Britain. For example, he claimed that the founders of the British nation were exiled Trojans who found a land populated only by a handful of giants, an unlikely tale. He also described Arthur's origins and parentage in a story which, although intriguingly romantic, hardly has the ring of truth. According to Monmouth, a king from the 6th century AD called Uther Pendragon slept with a woman called Ajurna. She was actually married to a nobleman, but Pendragon tricked his way into her bed with a highly deceitful strategy. 
he convinced a wizard Merlin to turn him into the living image of her real husband so that she was none the wiser that her lover was an impostor. The union at Tintagel resulted in the birth of a child. Arthur. Monmouth wrote, that night she conceived Arthur, the most famous of men, who subsequently won great renown by his outstanding bravery. However unlikely this tale and others in the history of the kings of Britain, in medieval times it was a smash hit. It seems there was a huge appetite for the story of King Arthur, whether it was true or not. As well as describing Arthur's birth, Monmouth tells the tale of how he claims the king met his end. According to his version of events, Arthur was badly wounded at the Battle of Camlan when the Britons fought with Saxon invaders. This battle is also recorded in the Annals of Wales which we mentioned earlier, although King Arthur's presence at Camlan is Monmouth's own addition. The Annals of Wales placed the Battle of Camlan in 537 AD, so that therefore is the year of Arthur's death if we believe Monmouth. After the battle the wounded king was carried to the mythical island of Avalon by a mysterious enchantress called Morgan Le Fay. And there Monmouth ended his story of Arthur. But of course it was far from the end of Arthur as a mythical figure in the centuries that followed. In excess of 1,000 copies of Monmouth's history of the kings of Britain were made and distributed. Don't forget, this was at a time before the invention of the printing press. So scribes would have laboriously written out by hand each one of the copies. The document became the most popular publication around with one exception the Bible. Monmouth's Chronicle truly enjoyed an extraordinary level of popularity. As we've seen, modern historians regard the work with a large helping of skepticism. But even in his own time, there were those who regarded his account of King Arthur with suspicion. One with serious doubts was William of Newburgh, a chronicler and contemporary of Monmouth's. He wrote, it is quite clear that everything this man wrote about Arthur and his successors, and indeed his predecessors, was made up. The spread of Monmouth's Arthurian legends was not confined to the shores of England, it leapt across the English Channel into France and other European countries. And the story of Arthur continued to become more elaborate. A French writer called Chrétien de Troyes added to the myth with his own contributions, apparently with encouragement from British and French royal houses. Talking to Smithsonian Magazine, King Arthur expert Richard Barber said, the Arthur story began to take off. 100 years later, you've got Arthur in Germany and all around Italy. In France de Troyes added details including an entirely new character, Sir Lancelot and a new location, Camelot. He also introduced the concept of the hunt for the Holy Grail, a cup from which Jesus supposedly drank at the Last Supper. Arthurian legend and Geoffrey of Monmouth's version of it continued to have a massive influence on British monarchs. In 1191, monks at the Abbey in Glastonbury, about 95 miles east of Tintagel, disinterred two sets of human remains. These, the monks asserted, were the skeletons of King Arthur and his Queen Guinevere. This may simply have been an attempt to get guests to visit the Abbey and spend money. Whatever the motivation of those monks, King Edward I, who reigned for 35 years from 1272 and was known as Longshanks because of his unusual height, took them entirely at their word. In his 2015 book A Great and Terrible King, Edward I and the Forging of Britain Mark Morris wrote, it was proof positive that the fabulous king about whom Geoffrey of Monmouth had written had once really existed. At least, that's what Edward believed. Edward I visited the site of this alleged grave of Arthur and Guinevere. The bodies were dug up yet again so that the king could inspect these hallowed remains. Edward may have been worried that a superstition which maintained that Arthur was actually still alive might be true. That might mean there was a threat to Edward's throne from the ancient king. The king and his queen who had accompanied him were presumably relieved to see that the skeletal remains were of a couple who were definitively deceased. Edward covered the skeletons in silk cloth and at last they were returned to the peaceful sanctuary of their graves. This story reinforces once more of the extraordinary power of the Arthurian myth, even or perhaps especially over British royalty. The Frenchman de Troyes added many colorful flourishes to the Arthurian saga. He noted that Merlin acted as a military advisor to Arthur and even led a charge bearing a standard decorated with a dragon that breathed fire, just as any self-respecting mythical beast should. De Troyes also introduced Viviane, the Lady of the Lake, who supposedly gave Arthur his fearsome sword, Excalibur. Another colorful character, this time British, added his own embellishments to the story. Sir Thomas Mallory, who was around in the second half of the 15th century, was the first to write about King Arthur in plain prose rather than poetry, according to website Britannica. Mallory's personal history is rather murky, although he may well have been in prison when he wrote his masterwork, La Morte d'Arthur, or The Death of Arthur. 
According to Hammer's Smithsonian Magazine piece, Mallory may have been in jail for rape or robbery when he compassed La Morte d'Arthur in around 1470. Unlike earlier manuscripts about Arthur, it was actually printed rather than copied out by hand. The printer was William Caxton, the man who introduced printing to England in the 15th century. Caxton printed Mallory's text in 1485. La Morte d'Arthur is notable for its version of the tale of a sword embedded in a large rock. Still a teenager, Arthur reads words that are carved into the stone, Woso pulleth out this sword of this stone and anvil, is rightwise king born of all England. Arthur of course, succeeded in wresting the sword from the stone, something no one had ever been able to do before him. That feat confirmed his future as king. Additions to the Arthurian legend were not confined to the Middle Ages. In the 19th century, Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote Idylls of the King, a series of 12 poems written over a 46-year period, in which he made his own contributions to King Arthur's story. In Tennyson's romantic telling, the infant Arthur had been cast away and floated in the sea. Baby Arthur is floating in the Bristol Channel, which just happens to be the sea that laps against the rocks of Tintagel, the site of what will be Arthur's royal abode. Merlin comes across the young Arthur and hides him away in a convenient cavern, known today as Merlin's Cave. He had to be concealed because the enemies of Uther Pendragon, his father, would harm the infant if they got the chance. So what has made the story of King Arthur, his Queen Guinevere and the Knights of the Round Table, such an enduring legend? Speaking to Smithsonian Magazine, Professor Lee Tether of Bristol University said, There is something in the Arthur legend for everyone it has got flawed characters with whom we can empathize, quests to achieve impossible goals, and an adaptable storyline that fits the socio-political landscape of the time. Dr. Tether adds, The interesting thing about the Arthurian legend is that it has periods of both ebb and flow. It's able to be molded to fit with current preoccupations, such that it can find applicability, no matter what the mood of the moment. Stories were transmitted orally and via manuscripts, meaning that no two versions were identical. In conclusion Dr. Tether said, it's actually impossible to identify an original version of Arthur. Arthur's appeal is, and always was, precisely in his multiplicity. It's certainly the case that Arthurian legend does not appear to have lost any of its appeal in modern times. Evidence for that comes in the shape of the 3,000 visitors who flocked to Tintagel every day during the summer season. Scott points out that these hordes of tourists believe that they're seeing King Arthur's castle. And some people in Cornwall make a good living from the footfall that's attracted to the Tintagel ruins. Three generations of the Parsons family, for example, own land in the village of Slaughterbridge, just a few miles from Tintagel. The Parsons, who run a museum and gift shop, say that their land is the actual site of the Battle of Camlan, that we mentioned earlier the battle in which Arthur was fatally wounded. The Camel River runs through the Parsons' land. Lying in the water is a stone column that may, or may not, once have had an inscription referring to Arthur. As so often with Arthurian legend, the truth is slippery. But the tourists, and the money they spend, are real enough. But is it possible to link the myths and legends surrounding Arthur to an actual historical figure? One man who has been doing just that for decades. Historian Nicholas Hyam was an undergraduate at the University of Manchester in the 1970s, when Arthurian legend first became a subject of study for him. At the time many serious researchers were trying to nail down evidence that Arthur really had existed. But Hyam became a skeptic despite the work of respected academics, such as University of Glasgow archaeologist Leslie Alcock and English historian John Morris. They and others claimed that there was evidence to confirm that Arthurian legend was based on reality. Hyam explained his rejection of their work. What really got me fired up was the constant flow of very bad history writing he told Smithsonian Magazine. Hyam continued, you've got a whole series of writers like Alcock and Morris, who accept what is not recorded until the early 9th and 10th centuries, as a factual account of what happened around AD 500. It's nonsense. But Scott is not so dismissive of Arthurian legends. Speaking about Tintagel, he points out that there is plenty of evidence that it was a Dark Ages stronghold, even though the current castle ruins date from much later. The Dark Ages were the hundreds of years after the Romans abandoned Britain in the 5th century AD. The country sank into anarchy and faced threats from invaders such as the Saxons. Yet after four years excavating at Tintagel, archaeologist Scott and his team have discovered compelling evidence that there was a substantial and sophisticated settlement there in the 5th and 6th centuries. Scott points out that any settlement on the Tintagel site would have been relatively easy to defend because of its only link to the mainland, a narrow spit of land. He believes that it's entirely possible that an exceptional leader might have emerged who led a defense of at least parts of Cornwall from foreign invaders. 
and just maybe, that might be the origin of the tales of the great warrior King Arthur. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.